This afternoon, our text is from God's Word as God's given it to us in the Second Commandment, where the Lord God says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. We'll turn to Lord's Day 35, where we make the following confession concerning the, the second commandment of God. Lord, the 35, we'll read that together. You'll find it on page 552 in your book of praise. And then we confess, what does God require in the second commandment? We're not to make an image of God in any way, nor to worship him in any other manner than he has commanded in his word. May we then not make any image at all. God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Creatures may be portrayed, but God forbids us to make or have any images of them in order to worship them or to serve God through them. But may images not be tolerated in the churches as books for the laity. No, for we should not be wiser than God. He wants his people to be taught not by means of dumb images, but by the living preaching of his word. Congregation of our Lord in Jesus Christ. In the first commandment that we listened to last week, there we see that the Lord warns his people not to serve other gods, but to serve the Lord God and him alone. And yet we saw last week that the reality is that mankind creates all kinds of gods to worship. In fact, we, even as God's people, we're often guilty of creating our own idols, idols that live in our own hearts. For whenever we set our heart in anything other than the Lord our God, we have created an idol for ourselves. And so we saw that so easily we set our heart on things such as money, and possessions, as if those are the things that will give to us the, what we need in this life. Or, or we set our heart on the fact that we look good in the eyes of other people. Or there is that need in our hearts to satisfy the desires of our own heart, and we look to other things for that rather than to the Lord our God. And so when we truly examine ourselves in light of God's Word, the reality is that as God's people, we're constantly battling idols in our hearts. Now, the second commandment addresses a, a little different issue. Here addresses how we serve the Lord, our God, how we serve the one God of heaven and earth. All right, the people of Israel in the Old Testament, they would speak about God as Yahweh. Uh, today in the New Testament, we don't only speak about God the Father, we also speak about the Lord Jesus as our God and as our Savior. And when we think about the Lord Jesus, you know that two people may say that they believe in the Lord Jesus, right? If you talk to a Muslim, a Muslim will tell you that they also believe in Jesus. And yet, when two people say they believe in the Lord Jesus, they think about Jesus and they serve him in completely different ways. We have a clear example of that in John chapter 4, when the Lord Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman. See, the Jews and the Samaritans, they said that they serve the same God. And yet the reality is the Samaritans serve God differently than the Jews would serve God. In fact, they even serve God in different places. The Samaritans did so at Mount Gerizim, and the Jews would do do so in Jerusalem, there in the temple. And so people often claim that they serve the same God. And yet, they have, and yet they have different beliefs and may have different beliefs about God. 
And so that the image that you have about God, what you think about God in your own mind, will determine also not only what you believe about God, but will also determine how you will serve and how you're going to worship the Lord. And that's why it isn't enough to simply say to someone, I believe in, in Jesus. We must also ask the follow-up question. So what do you believe about God? And what is it that you believe about in Jesus? Because what you believe about God, what you believe about Jesus, will determine how you're going to worship and how you're going to serve Jesus and how you will serve and worship the, the Lord God. Here in the second commandment, the Lord comes and he wants to warn us. Warn us that we do not make God into our own image, but that we serve the Lord God as he commands us in his word, as he's revealed himself to us in his holy word. Because there in, in the word of God, the Lord comes and he reveals who he is, but he also reveals how he wants to be worshipped by his people. And so God came and he warned the people of Israel. He says, do not, warn, do not worship me as, as the pagan nations, as the pagan peoples worship their gods and make images of their gods. You, my people of Israel, you are to serve me as I have commanded you in my word. Well, the Lord Jesus says to the Samaritan woman that true worshipers, true worshipers are those who worship God in spirit and truth. Those are important words. We live in a culture today in which we constantly hear that we are the ones who have to determine the truth. The truth is not what others tell us or tell you is true, but the truth is what you feel is true. Well, the Lord Jesus makes clear that we do not determine, that we cannot determine the truth because there's no truth in us. It is Lord God who determines the truth. And that truth he reveals to us in his holy word. And only those who follow the truth of God as, as he reveals that in his holy word are the true worshipers, Jesus says, and only they will enjoy the eternal life. And so this afternoon we'll confess God's word under this theme. God commands us to worship him in spirit and truth. So our theme, God commands us to worship him in spirit and truth. We'll look at what that means. First of all, what it means to serve God in spirit and then what it means to serve God in truth. When we think of the work of the word worship, worship literally means to bow down to the ground, it means to prostrate yourself in an act of reverence before someone. And the Bible makes very clear that only the Lord God is, is worthy of such honor, which we would bow down to, to someone. I have an example in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, uh, where the apostle John uh, fell down at the feet of an angel who, who came from heaven. Fell down at the feet of the angel to worship him. What did the angel say? Well, the angel said, John, don't do that. Don't do that, for I am a fellow servant with you. Worship God. And so what's clear is that no angel, no other human being are worthy uh, of such uh, worship. Only God is worthy of such honor. The other thing we need to understand, too, is that worship takes place when, whenever we as God's people, we come into the presence of God. You may remember when Moses was in the wilderness in Midian, the Lord God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And as Moses comes to, to see what's going on there in the burning bush, God commands Moses, Moses, stop, remove the sandals from your feet because the ground in which you are standing is holy. And Moses removed the sandals and he hid his face from God. You can say that that indeed was an act of worship. For Moses here, he comes face to face with the Lord God. Later in the history of God's people, we know that the people of Israel, when they went to worship the Lord God, what would they do? Well, they would go up to the temple in Jerusalem. And they would go to the temple because that is where the Lord God said, this is where I will dwell, this is where I will live in the midst of my people. 
And so the people of Israel, they would go to the temple in Jerusalem in their pilgrimages in different times of the year in order that they might offer their sacrifices to, to God and that they might give praise and they might give glory to, to God. That was their act of worship there in the presence of the Almighty. Of course, as New Testament believers and New Testament church, uh, we no longer worship the Lord God in, in the temple in, in Jerusalem. But we do meet every week on Sunday. We meet in the worship service. And then we may ask, so, so why is it that, that we get together? Why is it that we gather together as God's people every Sunday? Why is it that God's people come and, and do that and, and, and faithfully come every, every Sunday? Well, it's because we understand, because we know that, that God is present here in the midst of his people. As God was present in, in his temple in Jerusalem, so the Lord God is, in, is present in the midst of his people here in the worship service. That's the reason why we then also come together in order that we might worship the Lord. We want to give him honor. We want to praise him because we also acknowledge God alone is worthy of that praise. And as we come into the presence of God also here in this place, the Lord God is the one who comes to us through his word. And we hear his word also through the proclamation of the gospel that is expounded from his word. And the result is that we then respond with praise and through our prayers and with our song. Well, in the second commandment, the Lord instructs us how we are to worship him. You see, the heathen nations around Israel, they, they have their own way of worshiping their gods. But the Lord says, no, oh, the way that these nations and these pagans, they worship their gods, that's an abomination to me. The way that the heathens worship their gods is an insult. As God's people, God's people need to be careful. Careful that also in the way they worship God, they never dishonor God, they never insult God. But they are to worship God in a way that reflects His great glory and His holiness. And that proper worship of God, that was the issue. That was part of that discussion between Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John chapter 10. What the Samaritan woman said to Jesus in verse 20, he says, you know, our ancestors worshipped here on this mountain, referring to Mount Gerasim in Samaria. But you Jews, you, you claim uh, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So you notice where the dispute is. The dispute is, is about what's the right place where God's people should worship the Lord. And then the Lord Jesus replied, he says to the woman, he says, you know, a time is coming uh, when you will worship God neither on this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. And then he adds in verse 23, he says, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth and truth. As we reflect on those words of the Lord Jesus, first of all, I notice what Jesus says. He's about God. He says, God is spirit. With those very words, he is again reminding us that our God is not like us. No, we as human beings, we are flesh and blood. As flesh and blood, we are limited to the very things that we can do. We're even limited to where we can go, where we can be at the same time. God as spirit, God is not limited to one place. He's not limited to either to Mount Gerasim or to Mount or to Jerusalem. Right in the Old Testament, God indeed he commanded Israel to worship him in the temple in Jerusalem. Not because he couldn't be in other places, but because he wanted the people to remember that he's indeed living in their midst. But now that the Lord Jesus has come to the world, Jesus says, God will no longer be worshipped in one place. For since he is spirit, God will then also be worshipped in spirit. Jesus here, you don't understand that Jesus is reflecting uh, what Moses said to the people of Israel in, at Mount Sinai in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 12. Right, when God appeared to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, then Moses says, remember when God came to you? What happened? 
Well, you heard the sound of words, but you saw, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. And then Moses warns the people in Deuteronomy 4, 15. He says, since you saw no form of any kind when you, you met God, you must be careful that you do not make an idol, that you do not make an image of any shape from anything that you find in anywhere in creation, and that you then bow down to it. In other words, Moses says to Israel, he says, you are to worship the Lord your God in a completely different way from the way that the heathen people worship their gods. And yet, when you read through the history of, the Old Te of, of Israel in the Old Testament, you notice how there was that constant temptation among the people of Israel to make images of the Lord God, just like the other nations would make images of their gods. So why were, they not to make, why were they not to make such images? Well, when they, by making an, an image of earthly things to represent God, what you're really doing is you're bringing God down to a human level. Right? The very things that God has created are the very things that are now being used to try to represent the Lord God who is above His creation. God who is infinitely greater than all of that which He has made. How can you compare the things of this world to that God? Those things that God has created, that God has made, cannot adequately represent the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God. But Jesus also points out to the Samaritan woman that there is more at stake in this worship of God. Since God is spirit, he says you cannot, he cannot be confined to one place. But those who make images of their God... What they do, they want to confine their God to, to their idol and to their image. Because if you can confine your God to an idol or to an image, you now have the means by which you can manipulate your God. Now, perhaps you may remember from some of the stories of scriptures that what heathens would often do when they worship their, their idol, their God, is they would bring their food offerings to their idols. Remember Dagon? That's what they did. Um, the Philistines did with their, and their god, Dagon. And because they thought that by bringing food to, to their idols, they could feed their gods, they would give their gods the things that they crave. And if you give the, your god what he craves, and then he will also give you what you want. So what you're really doing here is you're bringing God down to a human level. Because you're acting as if your God has human needs. As if your God has a need to be fed. As if he needs your food and your drink to survive. Or as if he needs to enjoy sexuality. So you give your daughters to temple prostitution. And so if you take care of the needs of your God, then your God, surely he will take care of your needs. At some level, you can say that that also explains why the people of Israel built the golden calf at Mount Sinai. Right? That golden calf uh, was not intended to be another god. The golden calf was supposed to be an image of the Lord God of Israel. And what they were doing is they were bringing God down to a human level in order that they might manipulate him. Remember that Moses at this time had been up on the mountain already for a long time, and it was taking so long for the Lord to come back from his meeting with the Lord God. And the people of Israel, they were becoming restless, and they wanted to continue the journey on to the promised land of, of Canaan. And so they built this calf so that through this calf, they would also be able to force the Lord God to go along with them on the journey. See, the people of Israel did not trust the Lord God would indeed lead them in his time and that God would lead them according to his will. They wanted to be in control of the process. They wanted to be able to force God to follow their timeline. And that's why Lord God became so, so angry and he sent Moses back down again into the people. Because we have a God. Beloved, you have a God who cannot be manipulated because our God doesn't have any human needs. We have, there, he doesn't have things that we can offer to him that's going to satisfy any needs that he has. 
And so there's never any way that we have anything with which we can bargain with our God. And so also our God, God never enters into a bargain with us and says, you know, if you give me what I need, uh, then I will give you what you want. That, that is a terrible distortion of God's relationship with us as his people. As if God depends upon us for his own needs. And yet, sadly, the reality is that there are many, even many Christians who distort the very image of God. Because the reality, beloved, is that we are prone to do the same things. We tend to be also people who want to bargain with God that God may give to us what we desire. We know that in the Christian world, also in North America, and probably it's also th even in, throughout the world, in Africa as well, there's what we often refer to being proclaimed to what's called the prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel is indeed uh, quite big and, 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 big and, and huge within the Christian world today. The prosperity gospel promises that if you serve God and if you give God your heart and your life, then he will make you rich and he will give you what you desire. In fact, they, they will often even say, if your faith is strong enough, then God will give you your health and, and, and wealth. And if you don't have that, then your faith isn't good enough or your faith isn't strong enough. But if you truly believe and if you are a strong believer, in, and then, then the Lord, then you will also receive whatever you ask from the Lord. But beloved, that way of thinking, that way of serving God is pagan teaching. For the pagans, they thought about their gods in this way. They say, no, if, if we appease God, if we give what our God wants, we give him food to drink, we give him our daughters for sex, then God will also give us what we want. She knows what they do. They make God into their own image. They make God into a God that they want, a God that will give them what they desire. And before we kind of blow that off and say, oh, that's crazy and that's silly, the danger is that uh, we, uh, maybe perhaps in more sophisticated ways, but we try also in our own way to, to bargain with God. Lord, if, if you will give me health, or if you give me a new home, you give me a new job, if, if you give me enough money, then I will do this, I will do that for you. Then I will serve you with my whole life. Right? So easily we, we end into the same thing. We end up bargaining with God. And somehow if we give God something, then that God then will be obliged to kind of give us something back. But we need to notice, beloved, when we enter into that way of bargaining with God, that, we go on, that what's really happening here is we want God to serve us rather than we serving the Lord our God. Jesus also reveals that since God is spirit, God is the one who comes to his people and not we as his people who come to God. And so if you think of Mount Sinai, it's Mount Sinai. It's, it's not the people of Israel who came to God. It's the, the Lord God who came to his people there at Mount Sinai. Remember, it was the Lord God who came to Israel when they were in Egypt, and, and he sent Moses, and, and he delivered Israel out of Egypt. He led them through the Red Sea. He brought them through the desert, and he led them all the way to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, the Lord comes to his people and reveals himself on the mountain. Now, this becomes clear also in the discussion that Jesus has with the Samaritan that God is the one who comes to his people, as God came to his people, Israel, at Mount Sinai. For Jesus says to, for, G, for uh, the, the Samaritan says to Jesus this first. He says, I know that the Messiah is coming and that he will explain everything. And that Jesus declared that I am the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. And so what the Lord Jesus makes very clear to the Samaritan is uh, that the Almighty God is the one who sends him as a son to the world that he might reveal himself through Jesus to all of mankind. So the Lord God himself is different from the idols of this world. For God himself comes by sending his own son as the Savior. 
Idols never come to people. People go to the idols. But here we see the Lord God is the one who comes to his people. And Almighty God, when he comes to us, he knows our greatest needs. And because he knows our greatest needs, that's why he sent his son. Why did he send the Lord Jesus? Because he sent Jesus to deliver us from our own sin and from our misery. That was our greatest need, the need to be redeemed, the need to be saved. And so we need to ask ourselves, so what is true worship? True worship is that we praise and we glorify the Lord God who reveals his love and his mercy to us in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus himself made very clear. He said, I didn't come to this world to glorify myself, but I came that I might glorify my Father in heaven. And therefore, we do not bow down and worship the God that, that we envision and that we create in our own minds. No, we worship the God who has revealed himself to us through his Son, Jesus Christ. That changes the focus that you have in your life. It means that the focus no longer is on us and ourselves. The focus no longer on what I want and what I desire. But now the focus is on the Lord Jesus, who has finished his work of salvation here on this earth. Jesus, who is now ascended into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of his Father. But although our focus now is on the Lord Jesus, who is in heaven, and yet we also know that our Lord Jesus is not confined to heaven but that he now also dwells here with us as his people. He dwells with us wherever we are gathered in spirit and truth. Today, we gather in worship. And beloved, we gather here not because it is pleasant or a nice thing to do, although hopefully it is pleasant and is a nice thing to do, but that's not the reason why we gather here. But the reason we gather here is because we want to come into the holy presence of the Lord our God. Here in the presence of our Lord, here we come that we might bow down to him, that we might worship him. We come here because we want to praise him. Because in our hearts and our minds, we know that God alone is worthy of all honor and of all glory. Well, not only are we to worship God in spirit, but Jesus says we also worship him in truth. The Lord says to the woman, the Samaritan woman, he says, you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. So you notice as this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman was, um, was taking place, at first this conversation is about worshiping God in the right place. But now Jesus moves the argument forward to make clear that true worship must also be based on the truth. He says to the Samaritans, he says uh, that the Samar to the Samaritans, he says, you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. You know, you say a nice way to say that you do not have the truth. If you remember or know anything about the Samaritans, you know that the Samaritans only accepted the first five books of the Bible. Those are the books of Moses, written by Moses. And they rejected all the rest of the Old Testament. On the other hand, God has given his word to, to the Jews. That is also the whole entire Old Testament. And therefore, the Lord Jesus also argues. He says that salvation is from the Jews. And he says that not because the Jews are better, no, he says that only because the Lord has given the Jews the promise, the promise about the Messiah, the promise of the Savior. God, throughout Israel's history, God sent prophets, and the prophets continually, they directed the attention of God's people to the promise of salvation that God said he is sending them. And therefore, the Lord constantly condemned those of the false prophets in Israel. Why did he condemn those false prophets? because they were leading the people away from the Lord God, away from the truth, uh, away from a knowledge of the coming of the Savior who was coming. The word that was proclaimed by faithful prophets in Israel, that word was a source of life for everyone who believed. 
And now the Lord Jesus says, salvation is from the Jews. And then he goes on and he says, and I am the truth. I am the truth. Jesus not only proclaims the truth from God, but Jesus says, I am the truth, meaning I am the one that fulfills the truth. For I am the very one that God was speaking about there in the Old Testament. That means, beloved, that true worship of God always begins with the preaching of the gospel. And the, and the preaching of the gospel is the proclamation of Jesus Christ. That was the proclamation I read in the Old Testament where God says, I'm sending the Savior. That's the proclamation today in which the gospel's message is Jesus Christ has come to the world. And so if, as the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we're going to keep the second commandment today, it means that we are to proclaim Jesus Christ alone as the Savior of the world. The church is called to proclaim the very truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ. And that truth, beloved, that alone is God's word. And therefore, when we enter into the presence of God, as we meet together also here in worship, then here in the presence of God, the Lord himself speaks to us through the truth of his gospel. That's why also in the worship service, why the, the preaching is the central focus it must be the central element of our worship. For this is how the Lord God speaks to us the truth and by which he gives to us the hope of eternal life. Right? It is through the preaching of the truth in the Lord Jesus that the Lord gives to us that glorious hope of eternal life with him. It also reveals how foolish it is when there are believers who say, you know what? I don't need to go to church to worship God. Some argue that, no, since we worship God in spirit, uh, therefore God is everywhere. And if God is everywhere, then we can also worship when, when we go and walk, take a walk through the forest and we look and we go through God's creation and we take in his creation. Wherever we go, we can worship God. Now, those are pious words and they seem to be nice words and good words. But this pious words, they ignore God's command with regard to true worship. Right? There's always this danger that people want to decide for themselves how they will worship God. We live in a society where you can see consumerism is everything. People are looking for things that they consume, the things that they want, the things that they think they, they need, things that they can buy, and we want to have choice. Consumerism has also impacted the Christian church here in North America. Uh, so that there are many who look for a church uh, that has a worship style they say that they like or makes them feel good. It may depend on you know, the preacher, how well he preaches, whether he's a good storyteller. It may depend on the kind of music uh, that is being used. It can be a host of different things that, that might, people might find appealing. And so what happens is that the emphasis now moves from the preaching of God's word to finding something that makes us feel good. And the danger is that people no longer seek the truth, but people are seeking to fill a need that they feel. It might simply be seeking a need to feel, uh, to feel good at the end of the service. It might also simply be a, a matter of going to church for the social aspect because we want to have friends and that's where we meet our friends and that's where we have our, our, our social get-togethers. But beloved, when worship is turned into something that I look at fulfilling a, a need that I have, then our Christian religion is being turned into a pagan religion. For pagans, what do they do? They serve their gods not out of love. They don't serve their gods out of loyalty but they serve their gods to get what they want. And that's why pagans, why unbelievers, heathens, manipulate their gods, not out of, uh, why they manipulate their gods to fulfill what they, they want. On the other hand, when you look at the gospel, the gospel message does, does not allow for any kind of manipulation. 
And the gospel of the Lord God never comes, and he never promises us that I will give you what you want. Right? You don't find anywhere in Scripture where God says, what do you want, and I will fulfill those needs. You don't find anywhere where people come and say, God, we want this and this and that. God then gives it to them. No, when God comes in his gospel, what does God do? God comes and he promises that he will give to us life in Jesus Christ because he knows that is what we need. The church must proclaim the truth of the gospel because it directs us to the way of life in Jesus Christ. But you know, our sinful inc inclination is that we try to make God's word conform to our will. And therefore, we don't always want to hear what God has to say to us. God's truth, as we also heard that this morning, God's truth will often make us uncomfortable. For the Lord challenges the sinful desires that live in our heart. You know, that's always been a huge, huge challenge for the church throughout its history. Always been a challenge for the church to maintain the integrity of the gospel message. We, to, we, today we live in a culture where there is pressure to conform to the norms of our society. And that pressure is only increasing. Even to the point today, I would say, where the church is increasingly being coerced into adopting positions that are against the very will of God. Over the last few years, you can say that wokeism has advanced. Now, perhaps you're not aware of the word wokeism or woke, being woke. To be woke means that you be, wake up and begin to understand what the real needs and what the real problems in our society are and how we can then also deal with those problems in our society. But only those who are woke understand what the problems in society are. But, but who are the ones who are woke? Well, those who are woke tend to be the elite, the elite, the, the academics, those who are in, in really in powers of, uh, of authority and, and power, who really think that somehow they are smarter than anyone else, and somehow that they have the truth. And of course, they make this pious claim that they are fighting for justice in our society, and on the face of it, it seems to be a, a very good thing. But every moral issue is being turned upside down. Interesting, at lunch I was reading an article, this, this commentator, and this commentator had gone to a, a, a black pastor in Chicago recently. We know that Chicago is the epicenter of all kinds of corruption, violence, death. And this whole wokeism is the idea that uh, the problem that for the black community is the white community and white supremacy. And the woke people are saying, we have the solutions and we will send money and we will do this for you. And it's interesting that this black pastor who is on the forefront of the crime scene simply says these people at the elite, they don't have a clue. They haven't got an understanding of what's really going on. And it's, imp it's interesting where he also made the point. He says those who are at the bottom um, of society, they see things usually more clearer than those who are at the top, those who are the elite who say that they have all the answers. But those who are at the, the top, they, they think that they're smart enough to be able to solve the problems in our society. But they turn, as I just said, they turn everything upside down. All moral issues get turned upside down. And so that uh, when God's people oppose abortion, that they will say those who oppose abortion, they, uh, they promote the oppression of women. And we're accused of sexism. The old family unit of a father and a mother and children, uh, that old family unit is oppressive to other forms of relationships in our society. And so somehow we need to kind of get rid of that or we need to play that down or because, they're being because we're being oppressive. If you're a white person, you are being oppressed. You are you belong to an oppressive race that oppresses the minorities. If you belong to this country, Canada, uh, then you know that our history has always been oppressive, and we need to get rid of that 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 history in the past because it has oppressed all kinds of people in this country. 
We live in a horrible country with this way of thinking. If you insist on a male and female gender, then you oppress those who do not feel themselves to belong to either of those genders. Well, one, on the one hand, this idea is very divisive, for it divides the elements of society against one another. And by dividing society, they tell certain groups of people, such as the church, such as believers, such as Christians, you are the problem in society. And that way they then also cause people to cower under their agenda. And if you refuse uh, to agree with them or to follow their agenda or to promote their agenda, then you'll be canceled. Just a very nice way of saying they will destroy your life. The woke movement advances their agenda by shaming people into submitting to their agenda. They also attempt to shame the church into promoting their agenda, and the sad reality is that many churches have given in to the ideology of this terrible movement. Churches give in under the guise of justice. And that, beloved, that's a powerful argument. Because you know that justice is indeed a central theme uh, throughout scriptures. God is upset so often because there is so much injustice that has taken place here in this world. But when God speaks about justice, do you ever notice that, that God is angry with those who sacrifice their children to their gods, such as Moloch? That God is angry with those who abort the very children that he gives to them in the womb of the mother? You notice that God is, is angry with those who divide one people against another when the Lord himself has commanded us to come together as, as one people who are created in the image of God. Right? The gospel message speaks out against the divisive nature of our sinful society. And it calls all of mankind to unite under the one Lord, under one Savior, Jesus Christ. The living preaching of the gospel calls all mankind to repent from their destructive ways and to find their life and their salvation in Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, the true gospel preaching does not give in to the manipulation of people. Gospel, true gospel does not promise to the hearers what they want to hear. But it proclaims the wonderful promise of God in which God says, I will give life to you in Jesus Christ. The gospel truth directs our heart to the only way of life. And beloved, that is the Lord Jesus. And often this truth may feel uncomfortable because it doesn't always suit us. It doesn't suit us because serving Jesus also means that we are to, to submit to him. But yet it is the very balm for our souls. God promises to give me something much greater and much more glorious in Jesus Christ. All the world, they will offer something cheap. They will offer something that, will, that is destructive. But my Lord comes and he offers me something that is glorious. Oh, how I love your word, O oh Lord, for it is the power for my salvation. Amen.